Hi, how's everybody doing? Uh, this is Sifu Francis Durr. I'm here with Wilson Kong, my Sidai, and our Sifu, Sifu Bender of San Jose Wing Chun. Welcome everyone to the third episode of the Seeking the Bridge podcast. Today we have a special guest, my Sihei, John Ho. He is from Hong Kong. He came to the United States and he learned Wing Chun from Sifu Ben and Sifu Ken School. Welcome, Si Hing John, to the podcast. Good morning or good afternoon. I just want to uh, thank for the opportunity to kind of go over some of the stories that uh, I had been wanting to tell for a long time. So thank you for the forum. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, let me tell you something about myself. I, uh, I'm 70, I'm going to be 71 uh, coming up. I grew up in Hong Kong. I left Hong Kong back in 1967 when I was 17 and a half. I think Ben and surely anybody that, that grew up in Hong Kong back in the 60s can relate to what I'm saying. 1960, a lot of refugees came into Hong Kong from China. So China, was, Hong Kong was very crowded, especially in Kowloon, which is the other side of Hong Kong. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of people that uh, had no food, so they started end up robbing people on the street, especially the students. So. That was where people start taking up martial art to defend themselves. Uh, most of the time they got robbed was not by night point, it's just fist. You figure if you can learn how to defend yourself with your fist, you can be able to, you know, get away with it. And those days we didn't have much of a, a TV, so we listened to the radio, or we listened to all these Kung Fu stories. So most of us growing up in those era were so obsessed with uh, learning Kung Fu. And uh, at that time there was a lot of, uh, different schools because uh, a lot of martial artists from China came into uh, to Hong Kong, get away from the communists. So they opened a lot of schools and Yip Man was being the master in Wing Chun. Lao Fat Man, he was the Eagle Craw uh, master. They was teaching in Kowloon side. And then we also have Jiu Wai and Jiu Gao. They were the uh, Hong Ga style. And then we also have the Northern Prey Mantis, the Southern Prey Mantis. So it was very, uh, it was very exciting time. The instructor, most of the time, they did not want us to challenge each other because it created a lot of problem for them and uh, they didn't want any trouble. But the students themselves always wanted to try out to see whether or not this stuff worked. So we would get we got an underground fight and we would meet at a rooftop or we'll go to a, a school backyard and we would just go all out at it. Now, when I say go all out, it's nothing to do with UFC today. Uh, as soon as you see somebody fall down on the ground, the ref will stop. Or when you start seeing bloody nose or any blood coming out, or the guy take a body punch and kneel down, it will stop the fight. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I was not really doing Wing Chun at the time, but my good friend was uh, taken from uh, Lok Yu. He was uh, one level below Leung Seung. He was the uh, second student. And Leung Seung was, uh, was not really that popular among people because he was a he was the one that kept real low key you know he did not advertise and uh and, and he really taught it in the traditional Wing Chun way and uh so a lot of people did not want to go to him because it takes too long you know the fourth first form the first year you only learn the first form you know so people didn't want to waste any time learning Wing Chun but there was another instructor named Ji Wan. Ji Wan was a, 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 a junior student of Leung Seung but he was teaching a lot of cops, a lot of gangsters guys. And those guys were just fighting on the street like crazy. So it gave Wing Chun a bad name. I don't want to, you know, uh, don't, I don't want to disrespect uh, Ji Wan, but he's, some of his students just passed on to some of this guy. But they didn't have to learn a whole lot, just a couple of Jik Chong, <laughs> Pak Sao, Lap Sao, and they were cleaning the clock. They were just kicking people on the street. So. The, the best work on the street is learn Wing Chun. You can learn it in six months. You know, you can start fighting. And the other styles, you go in, they give you a whole curriculum. And then you can relate to that. You know, it tells you, you know, beginner, you learn to learn five form, you know, you know, and then there's a uh, middle, intermediate, you learn another five. And then at the end, you learn weapons. So in order for the Kung Fu instructors to make a living, they have to extend the curriculum. So you have to learn all these classes. And at the end, you might have free sparring, you know, that's the first, last one. So it might take four or five years before you even get a chance to spar anybody. 
So anyway, that was that was that was an interesting time, and we used to get beat up all the time. We didn't wear gloves or anything, but so a lot of time you have broken fingers and broken knuckles and stuff. I left Hong Kong in uh, 1967, and I started going to high school. I should have gotten to college the first year, but I plunked out a few years in Hong Kong, so I had to go back, come to the United States as a sophomore in high school, you know, which I should be the senior. I heard a story about Chinese guy getting beat up in America. So the first day of school, I would wear these Kung Fu shoes, you know, the old traditional Kung Fu shoes. I wear the class and walk around ready for a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, two guys came up to me and said, do you know Kung Fu? Man, I was like, I just stopped and go, how, how does he know? Turned out these two guys were taken from a guy named El de Cascos in Takachi Campbell guy and Northern Siloam style. So we became friends and, uh, and uh, so next thing you know, I started hanging out with Al's class and got to know Al real good. And, uh, and then I uh, met another friend, he said, well, I, I know Jimmy Lee. Jimmy Lee was teaching in Oakland at the time. It was 1968. So he said, I can bring you over to meet Jimmy. So I went to meet Jimmy and Jimmy was such a nice person. He took me in right away. He never even charged me a dime for, for giving lesson to me. And we used to train at one o'clock every Sunday afternoon. In the class, there was some really, really uh, impressive people. There was uh, Liu Fong, he was a old time Choi Lui Fai guy, Northern Siloam. And there was a uh, Bob Baker. Bob Baker was a karate guy and a boxer. In fact, Bob was the guy in one of the Bruce Lee movie, he played a Russian guy. They kind of hit him and that Bruce Lee chopped him in the throat and killed him at the end. That was Bob Baker, okay? Huh. All the students were uh, karate guys and mostly Caucasians and a number of uh, Latinos. And uh, they were really training hard. So he told me, you know, when Bruce Lee come down, I want you to meet Bruce Lee. I said, good, you know, it was really good. So a month or two later, he called me up. He said, oh, Bruce Lee's coming over to uh, Wally J's tournament. I don't know if you guys know Wally J. Wally J was a jiu-jitsu and uh, judo uh, instructor teaching in Alameda. So I go, okay, sure, I go, you know. I met Bruce Lee at Alameda at the uh, tournament. Afterward, we came back to Jimmy's house. Now, I swear to you, the, my mom's great. This is what the conversation I had with Bruce Lee. I don't know anybody who would validate this because nobody's around anymore, okay? But this was my first experience with Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee said, what do you take? I go, oh, I took a whole bunch of different style, Honga, you know, White Crane, and even my frame man, just because I was just teaching, uh, taking from different uh, style, from different friends. And he said, oh, he said, all oh, that stuff is BS. You can never use it. I was taking right away. I go, you know, I just met you two minutes, and all of a sudden you just trashed me and told me all the stuff that I ever learned was BS. He go, let me show you something. So i never forget that we got in the living room and he go, now, he put up his fist like a, a backhand. He go, I'm gonna throw a punch at you. I want you to block it. It came, the punch came so fast and, and I could feel all the air touching my eyelash. But he never hurt me, he never touched me. But it was so powerful that I thought if he nailed me, I'll be, I'll be out, just one punch, I'll be out. So we tried a couple more times and uh, I, I, I didn't even see the hands, you know? So I didn't want to argue with him, you know? And then we, we talked and that was it. About a few months later, I heard from Jimmy again. He said, hey, uh, Bruce is going, uh, going to be at Bob Baker's house. It was in Hayward in ten, on Tennyson Road. So he said, why don't you come down? So I came down with Bob, to Bob Baker's house. Bruce Lee was there, we were talking. And it was one year after he, uh, he shot the Green Hornet. And I thought at that time, he probably thought he was going to get a continuation. As you know, they got canceled after that. In fact, he was showing me this business card, say, Jan Fan. See, he didn't use Siulong, Lei Siulong. It was Jan Fan. In the business card, he said, private lesson, $150 an hour, you know. He was teaching James Coburn and Steve McQueen at the time, you know. So this time, Bruce Lee and I, he was showing me some sticking hand. I didn't know anything about sticking hand. So, you know, I, I didn't really appreciate what he was doing. But then later on, we start sparring out in the living room. And I never forget that because what we were training at that time was they call it extension psychic. You know, instead of just doing a psychic instead, you just shoot your whole entire body, your whole entire body will just go right through the person. 
It's just almost like there's no stopping. You don't pull back. Once that extension socket goes out, it goes. He kicked me. The first time he tapped me in the rib, he didn't hurt me. And uh, the second time he kicked me, he pushed. He didn't really kick me, but he pushed me. Next thing you know, I ended up in the kitchen. Okay. So the third time he kicked me, I figured I can just, I can just drop down and move away. In the middle of the extension side kick, he switched it to a, like, they call it a reverse roundhouse. I don't know what you call it nowadays. And again, his heel touched my eyelash. So that was an experience I had that I'll never forget. Again, he was emphasizing that you take all these Kung Fu lessons and learn all these forms. But you, if you don't know how to spar, how, you, how do you know it's going to work? You know, you cannot how to learn how to swim in a bed. You have to get in the ocean. Same as, as fighting. And one thing he said to me that I didn't get for a long time until now. He said, if you teach a wrestler how to kick and box, he can beat any Kung Fu guy. I thought that very insulting. And if you look at it now, you know what MMA is. It's pretty much what he said. So moving on, two years later, my sister came home one night and said, I met a guy in college. It was a junior college. His name is Kenneth Chung, and uh, he does Wing Chun. I go, really, really, you know, I want to meet him. So I go, why don't you invite him over for dinner? So Ken was kind enough. He came to the, my house for dinner. I think I'm going to feed him, and I'm going to see how good he is, right? <laughs> so after we ate, I said, what, what, can you come up to my room and, and show me some Wing Chun? He said, okay. So we got up there, and he go, well, you know, I can't really do a whole lot. I just broke my ankle from a, from a skiing uh, accident, and I still got my cast on. So I won't use my horse at all. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, the room was relatively small. It was not not very big. And I had sparred with a lot of Wing Chun guys before. And if you come at them, and they back up just a little bit, and you can start doing uh, some lateral movement, with some hooks and stuff to the, to the head because they, they have a hard time blocking the, the hook. So I go, okay, I'm gonna try that on Ken. I threw a punch at him and I came around to the side and threw an angle and threw a left hook at him, tried to anyway. But the minute I even threw the first punch, he was in front of me and he had his fist in front of my face. And I go, wait a minute now, he never even let me get off. You know, I couldn't even get off. So I go, okay, let me try it again. And I try a few times, same thing. And he go, wait until I can get my cast off and I really show you what I can do. So that was the end of that. They have a hard time blocking the, the hook, you know? So I go, okay, I'm gonna try that on Ken. So I, I threw a punch at him and I came around to the side and threw an angle and threw a left hook at him, tried to anyway. But the minute I even threw the first punch, he was in front of me and he had his fist in front of my face. And I go, wait a minute now. He never even let me get off. You know, I couldn't even get off. So, uh, so I go, okay, let me try it again. And I try a few times, same thing. And he go, wait until I can get my cast off and I really show you what I can do. So that was the end of that. And uh, he was teaching in San Francisco on Bush Street. So I did not really have time or money to drive all the way to San Francisco because I was uh, 40 miles away from him. A few months later, or a year later, I forgot, he had a school open up in a, in a garage in Union City. And he was teaching this couple, uh, Joe O'Brien was a, and his wife, they were both judo black belts. So Joe was kind enough to let Ken use the uh, garage as a school. They were never quite experienced because he had lots of, nothing but big white guys and Latino guys. Ken was really doing the first generation Wing Chun what I mean by that was he was using a lot more power than what he does now. He's totally different now compared to what he was back in 1971, 70. But those guys were killers, man. They were just, they were just amazing, right? And then we would have guys from uh, Bush Street would come over and work out with us on the weekend and stuff. And uh, there was uh, quite a good time. And then he go, well, I want, I want you to meet Ben. We went to San Jose. It was what? 1968, 69. So that was the first time I met Ben, okay? Ben was like 115 pounds. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, okay. So I'm gonna try him out. I couldn't try that stuff on, ben, on Ken. I'm gonna try the one on Ben too. 
<laughs> Same thing, man. You know, Ben was Ben was 150 pounds, and Ben was 100. Ken was 160 pounds. And next thing you know, Ben did the same thing to me as he did to ben, Ken, or that as ben, Ken did to me. So I was really impressed. And uh, but I was already doing Wing Chun then. So uh, another thing that Ken told me in those days that it still resonated with me, and I still tell all the guys. And he said, when you watch Ben, you see it, man. And Ken is a very interesting guy. He's a purist. He's totally devoted to Wing Chun like no one else, right? He wants the authenticity of Wing Chun. He does not want to mis misrepresent Wing Chun. So when he saw Ben, you know, the statue of Ben, you know, five, what, five, four, five, three, 115 pounds, and he turned Ben into a killer, you know? And that's why when he, when he said, watch Ben, they always say, watch Ben. No matter how big the guy come at Ben, he thinks, you think he's going to get Ben, next thing you know, the guy is on the side, you know? So anyway, this is my experience with uh, Ken and Ben. And uh, I know it's a long story, but uh, I think it's worthwhile for you to uh, hear it. Sifu, uh, Sifu Ben, do you remember that story uh, when you first met uh, John? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the first time he met me, he wondered, hey, Ben, let me touch your hand <laughs> right away. <laughs> you, know, you know, now he's even better. <laughs> I won't even join him now. <laughs> he would throw me out of the, out of the street now. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> but, 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 you know, one, one, thing about, one thing about Ben, and, and, and as I tell other people, an instructor is good, but don't watch an instructor, watch your students and watch your grand students. See if they can do what the instructor can do. When you do hands with any of Ben's student or Ken's students, you will feel the sensation that no other Wing Chun's people can give you. Because based on what I see, because I had checked, checked with different schools, you know, uh, I work out with different Wing Chun students. One thing that Ben and Ken has that pass on is the elbow power and the horse. Because the techniques are the same. How, how many techniques can you get, right? It's not the technique itself. It's the way you apply the techniques through the detailed instruction. I mean, you know, another thing about Ken, and, and, and if you know Ken, you know what, he, what I'm saying is, Ken does not want you to call him Sifu, okay? He just wants you to call him Ken. And he told us back in 1972, back in Union City, so that the, you know, the Americans could understand what he was trying to say was, don't call me Sifu. Sifu always represent a master, sit on a chair, have all, everybody sit behind him and you know, kowtow to him and kiss his feet, you know? Now, I want to be a coach, okay? A coach a job is make you better. Don't you think you agree with Ken that Ben and Ken are not the seafood, traditional seafood, you know, with the head up the sky. They're coaches. They want you to be better than them. So when you, when you, when you see Francis, when you do hands with Francis, he's just like Ben, just like Ken, but he's younger, you know, got more power maybe, you know, Aspiring. more endurance, <laughs> you know, but it's the same. If you, if you turn with, if you push hand with Francis students, you feel the same power as what Ken gives you. You know, that system works. Now, whether or not you can go out and fight on the street really depends on the individual because the bottom line is who you're fighting. If you're fighting some guy that never fought before, right, and he's half drunk and he's not as big, he's just as big as you, you should have the advantage. That's not skill. But if you can fight somebody that had a lot of experience in fighting and you can take him, then it's real self. Move on. Next question. So did you go uh, to with Bruce Lee down to, is it the, the LA? Oh yeah, no, 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 no. We're in the Long Beach, 1960. Oh, Long Beach, right. 19, I think it was 1967, July, 1967. You went yeah. with him. Yeah, Brendan, Brendan was only like four years old, five years old. I met Brendan, I didn't meet Linda, but Brendan was like, he had blonde hair. I go, wow, he got blonde hair, you know, running around. Yeah, yeah, Bruce Lee was there and it was Jimmy. He, he spot with Jimmy. But see, one thing I, uh, I want to point out that there was a very unfortunate. There was a rumor going on, uh, circulating that El Costco had spot with Jimmy and beat Jimmy, okay? It was a makeup story, obviously. Jimmy find out about Jimmy was very upset. 
And Jimmy knew that I was good friends with the Costco and all his friends, all his students. Basically, Jimmy did not want me to come around anymore. And, and, and I never really had a conversation with him and explained to him that, I, you know, I didn't know anything about it. But, but that, that was unfortunate because I, I think Jimmy was one of the greatest men I ever met. He was, so, he was such a nice guy. So at the tournament, now this is what Al DeCosco tell me. Bruce Lee didn't tell me that. Al said that he walked up to Bruce and I say, uh, hey, Bruce, there was a misunderstanding about, you know, me and Jimmy and this and that. And, uh, and Bruce said to him, I only believe what I see, what not what I hear. And that was the end of that. Now, Al was in Hawaii. He can, he can validate that. That's what Al told me anyway. So the tournament was unbelievable. You know, he, he called his black belt out. He was throwing beauty at the guy, and the guy didn't even see those hands. It was, he was doing those hand finger push up. And uh, yeah, I never forget that day. That was a, I think, I'm pretty sure it was July 67. Were there any other times you guys hung out besides uh, the tournament uh, afterwards? I only saw him three times, I think, and then and then and then uh, and then he went to Hong Kong, and then uh, next thing you know, you know, I was having coffee one night, and this guy walked in, David Cox. David was uh, another Bruce Lee student, or, or actually, it's Jimmy's student. I brought David Cox to Jimmy. David Cox came up to me and said, "Did you hear Bruce Lee had just died?" That was like I could not believe it, you know. But yeah, I wish I were taking. You know, sometimes you meet somebody and, 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 and you always think that you see each other again and it's no big deal. You don't take pictures, you know. We never took pictures, you know. I wish I was I'm taking a picture with him and I was sparring with him or doing, <laughs> taking a hand with him. You know, that would be, oh, worth a lot of money if I, if I did that. But, you know, <laughs> I have no picture of anybody, really, you know. What were you doing at the time? Were you thinking about going into acting at the time? No, 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 no. I was, I was, uh, I was just trying to, try to go to work. Try to get through the day, you know. Yeah. Try to Americanize, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun day. That was a lot of fun. Tell us a little bit about your acting career. Oh no, not much of that. <laughs> not much. You know, try different things. I always wanted to be an actor, and I, but I had to work for, to make a living. After thirty-one years with a big corporation, I, uh, I like to say that I got the golden parachute, so I was able to, to free myself and do whatever I want, and uh, got me an agent and try different different roles, but it's. The acting career is very limited, you know, especially a guy like me, you know, like there's not too many roles for me. I don't want to be some token guy, you know, like, see, Bruce Lee was really upset about that. Bruce Lee never wanted to be a, a hop sing type, you know, he didn't want to be, oh, yeah, yeah, boss, yeah, boss, you know, none of that stuff. So I don't want to be that either, you know, but, but now I take anything. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a hop sing, man. <laughs> no, you, uh, you were in a uh, very famous, I would say, uh, 49ers commercial. Oh, God. No, no, no. Uh, I still giant. remember it. It is Giants. It was, was, really uh, was at the Safeway, right, with the Giants? Was that the yeah, one? Yeah, what happened was that shoot was really funny because, because I supposed to be the victim, right? And this guy's supposed to be some biker dude, right? The guy, like, 6'9", you know, he looked really intimidating. But he was the nicest guy, right? And the scene was he was pushing me. He pushed me. So... I bang against the ice or ice chest, and they would bring all these kids to watch the commercial because the the mascot was going to be there, and the kids liked it. But while we were shooting the scene rehearsal, it was so real. The guy pushed me. I looks. I I guess I look so scared. There was kids crying. They felt so <laughs> sorry for me. That I was getting pushed, you know. So I I got kicked out of that. Yeah, it's acting. You know, be be fun. Be fun. Were there any any roles that you've done in the in the past that you you really enjoy doing? <laughs> yeah, I did a uh, uh, like a History Channel for um, as a uh, Korean uh, Colonel or uh, uh, Major Major. This is a documentary about uh, Korean War, where a thousand of American soldiers were uh, put into prison, and one day this new uh, Major came out. His name was Major Tiger. He started killing Americans on the spot and led them for a, uh, a death march for, and then half of them die, I think. The whole uh, purpose of making that story was that they trying to reunite with this one uh, veteran, you know, that was, they hoped that he was still alive and try to have a reunion or something. And uh, so I played the role of Major Tiger, not whipping people and, and stuff. That was pretty fun, you know. <laughs> yeah, I look real evil in that one. But I did another one for, uh, for this uh, uh, Chinatown uh, 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 emotional abuse is just as bad as physical abuse. So I play a father sitting dinner, having dinner with uh, the wife and two kids, and I start yelling at them, telling them everything, and then 
And then in the caption, say emotional abuse is just as, as bad as physical abuse. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> one lady, I in Chinatown. <laughs> hey, there's that guy. <laughs> two lady look at me and they point to me and they go, that's the guy. He's the mean one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I enjoy my acting. Then have you had a chance to try out your Kung Fu against other, other styles and like friendly matches with friends? In the past, because uh, I feel like you uh, may have tested it, some of the stuff out, some of the Wing Chun that you you learned to see, you know, what 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 works and what doesn't work, or what you've seen. I tell you, uh, I got into a real nasty fight one year. This is back in 1970, 71. There was a group called Tower of Power. I don't know you guys remember them. They they soul group, you know, real famous Bay Area group, and they would do a concert at Shibo College. And they oversold the tickets, and next thing you know, there was at least five, six hundred people could not get in, and they was getting pretty nasty about not able to get in. I was dumb enough that they asked me to be a security guard. Yeah, me, my size, was a security guard, plus one of my students, Ruben. Ruben's a big dude, you know. Ruben was pretty mean, you know. So Ruben and I were working as security. For, for whatever reason, Ruben's wife was there and somehow the, the door got open and some guy said something to her and Ruben should have just closed the door and just you know, keep them outside. Ruben got upset and went on and punched the guy in the nose, right? So next thing you know, three guys jumped on Ruben and I had to go out there, right? And so this one guy came at me. I was wearing this. I bang, bang would probably laugh about that. Those platform shoes, you know, those high heels. I want to try to throw a roundhouse, right? Because I was doing chicken dough and throwing a lot of roundhouse kick, right? Shit, and I slept right on the ground. You know, I got up, man. Those guys got on top of me. One guy, one guy picked up an ashtray because those are the cement ashtray on the school. He was ready to hit me in the head, you know? So I kicked him in the nuts, <laughs> you know? He went down and, and, and the cops started coming in and broke it up. So that was pretty nasty because I remember I took about four punches in the face because I felt the next day. There was a few guys on me. It was like 10 guys on Ruben, you know, but they broke it up. So, so well, now these days, obviously you're not going out and you're not a security guard anymore. So you're doing acting. <laughs> uh, you're not fighting people in, in the area that you're living. Cause I, I, don't, you even, got, I don't even do martial arts anymore. Yeah, I know you retired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just watch YouTube all day. You know? So, so what do you do? What are you doing right now in the during the quarantine, like to to keep yourself busy? Oh, I I uh, I got I got a big puppy. He's 110 pounds, and uh, he needs a lot of attention. So we walk five miles a day, and I you know I do my routine workout. You know I'm trying to try to stay fit and try to you know I can never keep up with Ben. You know, but Ben is the guy that's always stay fit. See, he's about Wing Chun. Okay, if you do Wing Chun right. After you work out with a guy half an hour, you sweating like a hawk. You sweating like crazy. And people go, man, those guys don't even do anything, but they're sweating like crazy. Because the body's working. If you sweating because your body's working, that means good for you. You know, and you can still go home and refresh and, and take a shower and you feel good. You know, you don't feel banged up. I mean, can you see doing taekwondo at the end, you put on some glove and you start punching, kicking, by the time you get home, you're sore, you know? You know? When you you don't get sore, you, you get a good workout. It's, uh, I don't know about any other style. That's why Wing Chun is so attractive to me. Because if you look at Wing Chun, it's come closer to real fighting than any other styles, you know? Because those guys don't, don't have the same sensation when they spar, you know? What else I was going to say about Bruce Lee? That was something else that I was going to say. I think you mentioned something about how uh, he told you something that, something he told you that not a lot of people know about, the Taiwan thing or? Oh, oh you know, it was interesting. Uh, see, too bad Ted Wong passed away a few years ago because Ted could validate everything I say because Ted to me was the closest friend to Bruce because I didn't know Ted for a long time. He and I never talked. We saw each other, and, you know, but we never talked. And uh turned out, Ted was from Hong Kong. I thought he was born here. So that's why he and I never, I didn't even know he spoke Chinese. But everywhere that Bruce went, he would bring Ted with him. I remember back in the Bob Baker's house that one night, I asked him, what is your goal? What do you want to do in the future? And he go, I want to go back to Taiwan to teach the military how to fight, train military. Now, don't forget in those days, the Chinese in Hong Kong support Taiwan, not communist China. 
So Bruce Lee was, we all pretty much allegiance to the Taiwan side. So he wanted to go back to teach. I go, wow, that was, that was different. You know, we didn't talk about movies. I want to teach the Taiwan soldiers how to fight. Probably nobody, I don't know anybody ever heard that one, but that's what he told me. Jeff Chin, he's like a Bruce Lee connoisseur where he just, he has like one of the biggest collections, right, Francis? I met him. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Francis, you know him. Here's a story with him. He was doing this study about Bruce Lee and, and Ken go, why don't you come with, uh, with me and Ben and we have that's right. some and then we'll go visit him. That's so, right. uh, yeah. I talked to him. I would just, you know, myself, just tell him everything, you know, before I left, because I had to leave early. I said, okay. I said, before I leave, I want to tell you. Okay, whatever happened, you need to work out with Ben before you before the day is over. Before Ben leaves, you need to touch Ben's hand, you know. I obviously he did, and uh, that's history. There were guys that did Wing Chun for a long time, and they would go to Ben's house and train with Ben. After a while, they come back and say, man, I wasted all my time, you know, on the other stuff. I heard stories like that, too. You know, I don't do it anymore, but I used to go to Ben's class, and... I meet guys like that. I will push them around a little bit. And, <laughs> and then a year later, I go back, man. This guy pushing me around, right? And I said, hey, hey, I told you guys. And Ken always say something that was always interesting. He say, If you're the same style, strength and rich makes a difference. If you both have trained at the same time and, you will, and you're bigger and you, and you both put the, put the same amount of time into it, the bigger guy is going to prevail, right? But then another big guy comes in, sign up, and all the little guys pushing him around. But three years later, the little guy can't push the big guy in anymore. <laughs> so it's kind of frustrating for the little guy because the little guy can shine for a little while with the beginners. But once they catch up three, four years later, they won't be able to push them. Am I right, Ben? <laughs> But Sifu Ben's yeah. a little guy, and he's been pushing everyone for, you know, 50-plus years. <laughs> yeah, but he sets traps. <laughs> they respect the old man. <laughs> no, you know, you know, you know I, I think it's true, you know? I mean, if you guys have to put the same time in, the, the, the stronger guy or the taller guy has the advantage. To have the advantage doesn't mean that he can kick your butt. Oh, I do want to say something about Bruce Lee. Ben might have been there. Back in 1968, there was a big, big, the biggest Kung Fu demonstration in San Francisco. I think it was in Masonic Temple, Ben. I don't know if you were there or not. So I went, Jimmy, that was before Jimmy kicked me out of school. Jimmy and I were still friends. And Jimmy go, hey, Bruce Lee's here. Let's go upstairs. So we went up the balcony. I could not believe the people that was up there, right? I was sitting next to my stone, the karate instructor from Hawaii. He was Elvis Presley karate instructor. There was Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis, a kickboxer, you know, the karate boxer, not Joe, Joe Lewis, the boxer. You guys know about Big Joe, too. He was, a, he was really good. And a whole bunch of other top karate guys sitting next to Bruce Lee. And every time when somebody go out there and, and doing a form, and Bruce Lee would stand up and yell, yell down there, it's all BS, all BS. This stuff doesn't work. I could not believe it, you know? He had the baddest do with him. He could do whatever he wants, say anything he wanted at the time, right? But nobody could hear him, actually, you know, other than the people that sat close to us. Yeah, he was very uh, anti uh, any kind of traditional martial art, you know? He doesn't think that stuff really worked. He really didn't think that stuff worked. One thing that I, uh, I wish Bruce Lee would have lived long enough and ask him now it would be very different because when Bruce Lee was alive, he never had a chance to go to China to meet some of those really good Tai Chi instructors, like from the Chance Village. I wonder what would Bruce Lee felt if he went back, had some time to spend some time in the Chance Village, how he would feel about Chinese martial arts. Ben, you went to Chance Village, right? Yep. Yeah, it's a different type of training there. Yep. Were you ever involved with the, the Wong Chat Man thing or were you around for those? those oh, no, no, you know, it isn't the thing. There was so many different stories, but I don't know, Linda, I think Linda, Linda Lee kind of gave the story, but I, I read so many different stories, you know? The only thing I heard was when Jimmy said was, they started out and Bruce just went at him, chick chong, chick chong, and got close to him. Next thing you know, Jack went there. He was on the ground and Bruce Lee would go me go me go me And that was it. That's what Jimmy said. But I tell you one thing, uh, we used to do a lot of, uh, they call gong sao, talking hand, but actually it's sparring. And at the rooftop, 
and the winching guys, they didn't, have, they didn't do much, the winching guy. You know, the Tong Long guy would put up the hand, the Charlie guy would put up the hand like this, you know, and the winching guy would go, boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, the other guy would just go all the way back against the, the edge. So, you know, we stopped. But you would not have fallen off the roof because there was another flat down there that would protect you. You fall off, you know, if you just come down. And it was it was pretty interesting. And then my friend Guan King, Guan, he was a, bless his soul, he left the, he left us a long time ago. He was the one that uh, brought me over to uh, Lockview School to watch. He was one of the top students. So I saw him fight this uh, uh, Northern student guy, you know, in uh, Jim Sa Joy up on the rooftop, you know. And Guan was 5'7", well, 5'9", about 150, 160 pounds. You know, he was good size at that time. And the other guy was tall. He was like 5'11", 6 feet tall. And uh, I saw him warming up. He was throwing some pretty nice looking cakes, you know. And uh, they go, okay, Scott. And next thing you know, man, again, you know, I think Guan did that. He was just, they were doing a lot of seng choy, seng choy, you know, double hand. He just came in double hand and just chopped the heck of the guy and pit him against the corner. And that was over too. And then there was another match. They called the guy Wu Jai. He was a Lai Hong student. I don't know if you guys remember Lai Hong. Okay, it's a story about Lai Hong. Lai Hong is still, he's, he's the grandmaster. Great guy, you know, real friend. He's just a nice guy. And his top student was fighting against uh, Guan. And he kicked Guan one time in his stomach when Guan first walked in. But Guan was on top of it. Just that one kick didn't do anything, man. Just walked right through that kick and knock him down. And it was over too. I was fighting this one uh, guy, uh, Southern Prey Mantis. No, no, he was Charlie Fudd. I think it was Charlie Fudd because he used to, you know, the, he hit me in the rib. I was hurting for a long time, you know, because those punches are pretty nasty when they can just drill right, right, drill right through your hip, you know. But those Charlie Fudd guys, they came from uh, Tom Fei Pang. Okay, Tom Fei Pang was the, uh, the famous uh, uh, Charlie Fudd master, and his father was Tom Sam. So they were, came from a real good lineage. You know, I mean, I was only 16, 17, you know, I was, but I had those experiences, you know, that most people never, you know, if you grew up in America, you never have those experiences, you know, you'd be playing baseball. And, but for me to be able to experience those things, I'm, it's a blessing. I'm so thankful that I had those experiences in my, my teeny, teenage years, you know. Those are the, the Baymo matches, right? In the rooftops? No, Kong Sao. Yeah, Kong Sao, you know. Ben, did you ever do that when you were in Hong Kong before you came? In the rooftop? We do the dance party. Oh, okay. <laughs> ben, ben was a lover. Ben was a lover. Uh, <laughs> you have those four o'clock. They have all the bar open, right? The nightclub open at four o'clock. You can go and tea dance, right? That's where you find Ben, I think. Yeah, you know, like the dance party, uh, uh, Hawkins and those guys came to my house and we all have a good, good time. <laughs> uh, see, here's the thing about in Hong Kong. See, in those days, there was two, two, two different types of school. You have the English school, you have the Chinese school, okay? The English school is like Ben. Ben, ben went to English school, right? And Bruce Lee went to English school. And, and they were supposed to be the hip generation. The yeah. rock and roll, you know, they like to dance. <laughs> child, child, child. Right. They really into girls and stuff, right? I went to the Chinese school, okay? We were a bunch of duds, you know what I mean? Uh. We, <laughs> we, we, we didn't chase girls, we just learned how to fight. The only thing we do was fighting. We used to fight fish. You know those Thai fish? We used to fight them. We used to fight cricket. You know, those cricket, you know, you fight cricket. And then you fight those koa. They look like spiders. I just yeah. come see mouth. Yeah, you put them, they fight like crazy. That's what I like to do. I used to fight. And then and then they had one place in the hunk in Kaolu inside. If you go at six o'clock Sunday morning, they will fight dogs. They will bring Jesus dogs. Christ. Crazy time in Hong Kong. They don't do that anymore. I think they clean that up, right? I'm guessing they clean the dog oh, running no, up. Oh, no, that's gone, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, in those days, you have the, the young thugs. Then you have the organized crimes. And you got the cop. The cop was just as bad as the organized crimes, right? Very corrupt society, you know? But the, the street gangs were different. They were not organized crimes. They would just rob you. Did you ever get robbed in, in Hong Kong? Yes. But that was 13 years old. They, they used to rob students, yeah. What happened? Yeah, when I go to school, then somebody, uh, you know, get uh, walking on the Aga Lou guy. Someone uh -huh. tap on my shoulder. Hey, did you hit my brother? I said, yep. no, I don't know. I didn't hit your brother. Oh, my brother's over there. I, uh, I, I show it to you. I was so stupid to follow him. 
<laughs> when I go to the alley, he chopped me here and then he, and then he get my watch, a brand new watch. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. It happened all the time, right? My first experience. Yeah. I don't know. I maybe maybe I had always been an actor. I I have a couple of buddies that uh, they were getting harassed every day. You know, they were same game. We stop them and ask them lunch money. So they were getting tired of it, and they told me about it. So I go okay. So I find a guy. I learned the name of a certain game that was a really badass game, and I yeah. told him that I was from that game, and told him the guy to back off, and he did. You know, he. <laughs> I didn't fight the guy. I just told him that I was from that gang, you know. So that was pretty interesting. But I tell you what, though, if I if I did not leave Hong Kong, because I was so bad in school, there was only going to be two choices for me: either join a gang or be a cop. Because you don't need to have a lot of education to be a cop. Yeah, <laughs> Right? Yeah. So I, I would have chosen to be a cop, probably. See, uh, I I was uh, living in some Sui Bo area. Oh yeah, rough area. Yeah, I know a lot of you know good friends. They are watching more guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, what my friend told me, you know, Lei Xiu Long, I watching more or something like that. But I don't know if it's true or not, you know. But uh, one time, you know, my uh, one of my buddy uh, almost about fight with a Pang Gam Fat, and then uh, Bruce Lee is the one who. Separate, you know, both both sides, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, we, you know, my friend is a uh, Hong Ga. Uh -huh. uh, he can, uh, he learned from Chen Han Chung. Okay, you know? yeah. yeah, Chen Han Chung, yeah, very famous. Yeah. Then like uh, Pang Gan Fa learned from Yip Man. I know both guys, you know. They are so close to 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 challenge each other. And then uh, finally, Bruce Lee separate, uh, you know, separate them. <laughs> yeah, those guys used to fight all the time, but but they they didn't have weapons. We didn't carry a knife and stuff, but I did carry a hammer one time. I put a hammer in my back. <laughs> I a hammer in my back. I'm gonna nail those suckers in the head, you know? I'm not gonna fight them with a fist, nail them in a the hammer. <laughs> yeah. Stick myself in the ass, you know, with a hammer. But Which which were the, the most famous Gong Sao ones at uh, different schools that you usually saw? Was it a variety or is it mainly like Wing Chun and Chole Fight or Wing Chun and Hong Ga or Hong Ga and Chole Fight? Well, you know, what's interesting was, uh, then I don't remember. Uh, that was a hospital called Gongwa Yu Yun. Yeah, you know like uh, uh, Wang uh, Wang Sun Leung and my Ngai Yuk Pong. That is a very famous fight. Oh, really? Remember? I didn't see it. I didn't. Know. I, I did not see it. It's a high uh, Yi Lei Sabah Kun or something like that. And then like uh, Ngai Yuk Pong is Bah Ko. He's my classmate. Lai Yuk Pong and and uh, and uh, Wang Sun Leung. They fought real good. Yeah, I uh, I, I took it from uh. It's kind of interesting, Kong Bun Fu. His name was Kong Bun Fu. He was uh, the number one student. Uh, uh, there were three tigers, you know, Chan Hak Fu, Lok Ji Fu, and Kong Bun Fu. You know, my instructor was Kong Bun Fu. He was the number one student. But he was like Leung Seung, quiet, but he was the best. And nobody, but he never made any, many, uh, any uh, publicity. And then uh, Lok Ji Fu, you know, it's very right. famous. That's Quentin's. That's Quentin's instructor, Lok Chi. Yeah, Lok Chi Fu had Quentin's instructor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like your Chen Hao Fu, that's a very famous Sam Fu in right. uh, Wei Kui right. style. Right, right, yeah. There was a place in Hong Kong uh, called Sui Tong San, you know, in Gao Lu. You walk up and and every Sunday morning we we'll meet there and, 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 and we we're friends then, you know, we we'll not challenge each other. We we'll just martial art enthusiasts. It was made up in Southern style, Northern style, pray mantis. One of my friends was Jew and student. He used to come and spar with the white cream guys all the time. But we became friends, we'll go, you know, go to lunch afterward. It was, it was fun. I was like 17. If I stay there, I would have just, just keep, keep working on it. You know, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. You still keep in contact with uh, the white crane guys back in the day? Or? No, no, I wish I kept in touch with those. They, they were the nicest people too. You know, I don't know they're around anymore. You know, this is, you know, six almost sixty years ago. You know, I left Hong Kong. I never. I'm not like Canada band. You know, I don't have a, a close uh, uh, contact with anybody in Hong Kong. I only visit Hong Kong three times since I left, and they were just quick visits. I never. I went to Wong Sun Leung School. It was an interesting thing too, you know. And I walk up there, and I walk in. There was like five, six guys in the school. They were all sitting down smoking cigarettes. I go, shit, nobody's working out, you know. I walked in, I go, I go, uh, uh, I say, I say, who's your instructor? They kind of looked at me, you know, these are younger guys. I was, how old was I? I was in my 30s, I guess, you know. 
and they were like in the 18, 19 years old. They look at me and they go, who are you, you know? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm from the uh, United States, you know? I wanted, because I already met Wong Sun Leung when he, when he came out, uh, Ken had uh, brought them over for a seminar, you know? Or Ken didn't bring them, but we had a seminar with, uh, with him. So I knew him already. So I thought I'd come over and visit him. And he's all, oh, no, he's out of town and, and his instructor is step away, you know? So I waited, I waited, the guy didn't come back. And I was going, man, I gotta try this guy out. So I go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I start working out with them. I don't know, they were not very experienced, you know? And uh, so I left and I went to Cho Seung Tin school, you know? Knock on the door and Cho Seung Tin. Cho Seung Tin, great guy, he just loved me, right? Cho Seung Tin, I don't know why, he took a liking to me. Oh, come on, I thought he was laughing at me, you know? Come on in, come on in. And and, and, and I watch, I watch, I watch, and finally I go, you know, it was hot, you know, you know, Hong Kong summertime. The guy had a, they all took off their shirt when they do doing a Wing Chun. I, I saw this one guy, I, been working out for a while. I asked myself, I said, I said, can I, can I work out with him? You know, he said, sure. You know, I was just so such a stupid egotistical suck. You know, I want to show this guy what I can do, you know? So I start hitting him in the chest, but not hard, but slap. The next thing, you know, his chest all red and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and afterwards, he suddenly pulled me over. He go, yeah, you hitting him, but use too much power. He said, look at you, you're huffing and puffing. The guy's not even huffing and puffing. I go, oh, okay. So he was just trying to tell me, you know. Ken been telling telling me all my life I used to move four. So not the only one, but Choi Seung Tin said, you know, gotta relax more, you know. And he was just a most gracious instructor too, just a wonderful person. I, I'm very, very fortunate that all the instructors, all these kung fu masters, artists I met, they were just nice people. Nobody, nobody, no, no evil bunch. Because if they if they're really dedicated in a uh, in martial art. They're not thugs, they're not bad people. You know, bad people don't spend time doing martial arts. I mean, just like I tell the thugs, they only learn a few techniques and they go out there and start kicking butt on the street. But they gave Wing Chun a bad name. They call that, man, do you remember? They call Wing Chun, it's called Fei Jai Kun. Yeah. Right? Fei Jai is Young Punk. Young Punk, young punk style. That's what people call Wing Chun. That's what, when you take Wing Chun, they right away associate it. Fei Jai, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Did you ever get a chance to meet uh, Lucky Yu by any chance, or no? I saw him, but I never. Uh, he came over, there, but Lucky Yu wasn't uh, wasn't that active at that time. Uh, but his students were really, really good, really, really good. Yeah, they were doing the Sun Kun, incredible. You know the power they use without jerking, without any movement, just come out very powerful hands. Yeah, there was a good day. Was what? That was nineteen sixty six. Yeah, Leung Sun. You know, them. so I didn't know him. I like said the mechanic told me, God, man, you know, six months, I'm still doing this, you know? <laughs> yeah, Leung so Seung is a very nice guy. Somehow he and I very, you know, we could get along so well. He left when he was in his 50s, you know? That's how bad. But I can tell you that I don't, I, I never met any uh, uh, other uh, classmate, Ben other than Jack and, uh, and the other guy, uh, the guy that lived down in Los Angeles. Si Wong? Yeah, Si Wong and uh, Jack Ling. Yeah, that's it. Those are the two guys. So, okay. But I don't know any of uh, Ken's uh, older classmates. And I was telling, uh, let, Ken, let Ken tell you the story, you know, when you get a chance to have him. Ask him about when he first went back to Hong Kong. He was pushing all the big guys around the United States. And Leung Seung gave him a disgust look and said, using too much power. Remember that, Ben? Ken told us. And then he yeah. said, use a sick hand for six months before I touch your hands. Yeah. See, Wen Chun did not approve all those chopping and stuff. We call Dude, those yeah. kill the hands, man. They were just, you know, scared the hell everybody with those hands, you know? John Wong was chopping the soul like no tomorrow. See, when we were on the push street, uh, what Ken show us the hand like this, yeah. we move everybody around. But when, when Ken come back from Hong Kong the second time, say, hey, Ben, don't use that no more. <laughs> there was <laughs> one hand stop you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the hand is so effective. A lot of people, you know, cannot do nothing on that kind of hand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there was a guy in Union City. He was the mayor of Union City, okay? Leo. Okay, Leo was 6'6", uh, 280 pounds. Man, can't move him like no jump off. Well, he, he's flying all the way against the ball, you know? Yeah, so Ken thought he got it. And then when they went back, well, let Ken explain that one. That was a very good one. Uh, and that's been, you know, that's a 
great interview with you, uh, Si Heng John, and thank you, Sifu Bender, for you know coming in and, and talking to us about this too and bringing back the old stories. I want to thank you, John. That's awesome. You, I've been wanting to talk to you for so long about you know all these stories that you, I've been wanting to hear from you. Hey, thanks, guys. Thank you again. Thank you so, so much for taking time every day to, to do this with us. Uh, and we hope to see you back. Love you guys and stay safe. Huh? Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> you. Bye.